Well, good morning again. Uh, well, in the introductory talk, the general situation of urban geoarchaeology throughout Europe has been briefly sketched, and present contribution will basically focus on Belgium, which is a highly urbanized area uh, with quite some famous medieval cities such as Bruges, Ghent, Antwerp, Ypres, Brussels, Tournai and Namur. Now, despite the numerous big excavations that took place in the centers of many towns, over the last century, urban geoarchaeology for Belgium is quite a recent development. And one of the pioneering studies in Flanders was a study of the urban dark earth in the center of Ghent in 1996-1997, um, which was led by Georges Stoops and Roger Lango of University of Ghent. In Brussels, we have also in the 90s a series of pathological studies that have been carried out in the center of town. Most of them related to problematic of construction of the first city wall. And in the same period, we also see that there were two investigations in Wallonia, uh, one in the center of Liège and one in the center of Namur. Now, a major breakthrough came basically in 2001 in Brussels, uh, when the Brussels capital region decided to engage a geoarchaeologist to perform systematic geoarchaeological follow-up on all the archaeological interventions. And at the same time, what happened is that a specific research protocol has been developed, first only focusing on the geoarchaeological aspects, later also on trying to integrate other environmental disciplines. Now, just to give you an idea, these are all the excavations uh, that have been carried out in the center of Brussels over the last uh, 20 years where geoarchaeology has been applied. Now, if we look at Flanders, the situation is a bit different. Uh, despite the pioneering studies from the 1996-1997 uh, in the center of Ghent, we basically need to wait until 2009 with excavations in the center of Aalst and Antwerp uh, before geoarchaeological research is again performed. Now, there is a growing number of studies uh, within towns. Here you can see that basically all the red dots are the towns in which uh, geoarchaeological research has been performed. Uh, so there is a growing number of studies, uh, mainly in, in towns like Brugge, Ypres, Ghent, Aalst, Oudenaar, Antwerp, uh, Lier and Mechelen, and also in Tongeren. But there is still today no systematic follow-up. Uh, although the guidelines uh, that have been installed explicitly require pathological follow-up on these excavations. What happens basically in most cases is that uh, a pathologist is just called in to look at the subsoil, but not at the anthropogenic deposits on top of it. So it's a bit a bit of pity that uh, if you have this geoarchaeologist at your disposition, not to use it also to look into the urban, uh, in the urban part of the, of the excavation. So it's a bit, a bit strange though. Also in Wallonia, uh, the, the, the first uh, studies from the 90s that did not really lead to a systematic research. It's, uh, well, it's still very occasional in Wallonia to have um, geoarchaeology uh, involved in the in the excavations and what we see basically it's mostly limited to some uh, field interventions so some field observations uh, which have been done in quite some, some times now but it's only in one town and that's in Mons that the geoarchaeological study also included a, a micromorphological study so that's the the only case up till today so that's a brief overview of the situation uh, that we are facing today. Now, what are the topics that have been studied? Well, the most hot topic, of course, is still the, the urban stratigraphy, uh, which is quite basic, but a crucial question. Um, and already said it in the introduction, this can be quite a challenge because we are often facing so many uh, different deposits and also sometimes uh, the profiles that we have to study can be very limited in extent. Here we see uh, yeah, well, this profile only measured about, I think, 30, 40 centimeters. So it's, it's very deep, but it's very small. And it's the only window we have to try to reconstruct what happened. So it's not always that easy. 
And basically, it also we have been focusing on two main questions. Uh, one question is about these dark curves, the thick homogeneous deposits, and the other one is on the on the, on the more microstratigraphic level, where we have these these tiny layers, millimeter thick. As for what concerns the dark curve, you've already given the definition in the introduction. Some more examples of such dark curves that has been encountered in Brussels over the last year. So what you can see that there, there are quite some differences in appearance. Basically what they all share is that they are dark in color and very homogeneous. And well, the systematic study of these dark curves in Brussels has also permitted us to to get uh, an idea of about what happened, which are the processes that are involved. So we're thinking about accumulation, mixing homogenization, erosion, decomposition, other types of pathogenesis. There are different agents. There is the human factor, but there's also everything which has to do with more natural factors. And there can be quite some uh, different activities that are involved in, uh, in, in the formation of these dark earths. So it's not just a dump of waste. Uh, it can be dealing with gardening, it can be about agriculture, it can be about soil extraction. Uh, sometimes there are also artisanal activities involved, so it can be quite a different type of uh, activities. Now, what we have been able to do in Brussels, because we had so many different excavations going on, we could also draw a map of activities. Uh, and and it's, it's quite important because for the town of Brussels, uh, for the initial formation of the town, we have basically no written sources. So the only thing we can rely on are these sediments. Uh, and well, we were able to make, it, make, make this kind of map showing the different activity areas within, within the, the early town. And what we see is that basically there, there's still a very strong rural component in, uh, in the origin of, uh, of Brussels in the 10th, uh, 13th century AD. Now, uh, the, the second thing that we have been studying a lot is the, these microstratified layers. And these are two examples from the same site in the center of Brussels. They look very similar. It's twice uh, a very, very uh, tiny uh, succession of uh, dark colored deposits. But if we look at the micromorphology, we see that they tell us quite a different story. The first one shows us that we are dealing with these layers of phytoliths, uh, a lot of excrements in it, um, and well, it's basically dealing with uh, a kind of stable. While the second one is much more cleaner, uh, it's also much more precarious, and basically here we are dealing with constructed flow. So two different stories which could not be observed on, on, a, on, a, on a field scale. Another ex uh, quite impressive example is from the center of Antwerp, where we had this succession of uh, very tiny layered deposits, showing us also different phases of occupation, where we have uh, phases which are more related to stabling again, and we have the more uh, nicely clean house floors, we have also some ash layers in it. So basically we, we, we can try to reconstruct history of, of, of one single uh, space uh, through time. So that was quite interesting also. So that's one aspect that we can have been dealing with, uh, was basic uh, site stratigraphy. But there's something else which is also quite interesting. We have uh, been dealing with urban soils. And well, when we look at the soil map of Belgium, which is very detailed, we have about two ma uh, observations for each hectare. We see there's something very strange when we are dealing with the urban area. This is, for example, the center of Lier, which is one of the towns in Flanders. And what we see, it's a big blank. And the reason is quite simple, it's never been mapped. So basically, we have no idea about the urban soils. How do they look like? What are they? And, well, all the observations that we were able to do over the last years permit us to to get, get some ideas about the, these, uh, these soils. And what we see is that there are quite some natural soils which are very nicely preserved below the urban security. We have some peat soils, we have some alluvial soils. Uh, we have also examples of very nice pot soils. This is an example of the center of Mechel, which you see below the dark earth, we have this nicely preserved pot soil. And what we also have uh, soils which are slightly affected by human activities. Mainly agriculture. These are, this is an example from Aalst, this is an example, another example from, uh, 
from Antwerp. And well, sometimes we are really lucky, and then we even find the spade marks. As an example, from the center of Brussels, that we have, uh, I think it's 12th and 13th century AD spade marks. So quite impressive. And what we also see, urban contexts, especially if we move to the more recent periods, there's a massive, uh, often quite a massive uh, transportation of sediments, which also leads to the formation of new soils. But we hear this quite interesting sequence. Below we have an, an ancient soil which is quite well preserved, showing a uh, trace of agriculture, so a nice plain horizon. On top of that, there's a huge deposit of, of sediments, on top of which we see a new soil developing, this, uh, this time related to gardening. So basically we start to have different uh, types of plant materials in this sequence. And that's another thing that we are able to, to reconstruct. And this, this sequence also shows us that we are able to reconstruct uh, ancient topography on a site level. Uh, this, for example, the site in the center of Brussels, where we see that between uh, the surface of the 9th uh, and 11th century, and today there's about three meter difference. We also see huge differences on the, uh, on the second side, where we have from the period of the 10th, 13th century, is about one meter, two meters below uh, the surface of the 15th, 16th century. And then if we go further up, the actual surface is even higher. So if we have enough uh, spaces where we, or sites where we can observe these kind of surfaces, we are able to make maps showing the evolution of the relief through time. But of course, then you need to systematically look at each excavation, try to identify all these sur ancient surfaces. Another problematic is ancient soil pollution. Uh, this this, this uh, example shows us basically that we are sometimes facing traces of ancient soil pollution, dealing with uh, metallurgical uh, issues, like the ones uh, Rubini already showed, with huge peaks in land for instance, and also micromorphologically, you can quite often find back traces of uh, slag. This is an example from uh, from Lee, uh, from the marketplace, the central marketplace, where we also have some nice traces of, uh, of slag that have been observed. And these marketplaces are also quite interesting. Now, have been a point of interest over the last years because it's rarely done. It's rarely there's rarely any. <laughs> Geoarchaeological studies on markets, uh, which, is, which is a bit silly <coughs> because they can offer us so much detail about the activities going on in these areas. And, well, uh, just before finishing, because I've seen I'm running out of time, um, there's also quite some, uh, some work on the interdisciplinary approach because it's not just geoarchaeology, it's also geoarchaeology together with other disciplines. Also, Rovina showed us the example with integration of zooarchaeology. We tried also to do this with archaeobotanical research. Uh, as an example of, uh, of study uh, on, on the Senna Valley. And there's another example where we tried also to integrate insect analysis uh, to, to decipher what exactly happened in all these floors in, in the center of Antwerp that we we're looking at. And of course, there's also a component of uh, trying to synthesize all the information that we have and to develop a, a, a better uh, theory about what we are dealing with. And now just to finish, really, <laughs> uh, what are the perspectives? Well, I think there's still a lot of work to do. We need to have more observations within each town, the more the better, and which will definitely help us to develop uh, a study of the urban landscape and the soilscape and also try to integrate not just to stay into the centers of town but also look at what's happening outside and try to integrate the whole. So yeah, that's it. Thank you.